Um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak, of course, and um, also thanks for moving me forward in the agenda. It also suits me. I have to get off early. Um, I'm going to give an overview of what we've been doing in uh, free energy perturbation at Janssen, some of the work we've been doing the last few years. Um, it's basically application, 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 right? So it's going to be, I hope it's not going to be too boring, but it's what's really interesting and motivating for us is to really test this repeatedly, different targets, the same target, different molecules, understand what's happening, find cases where it's not working, etc. I'm not going to go through the introduction other than to say, you know, this is free energy perturbation. We're going to be using the Schrodinger methodology. Well, what I'm going to present today is going to be with Schrodinger methodology. Uh, a bit like David presented this morning, so you're going to see some familiar things. And just to say, the opportunity to do really quantitative molecular design is, what, is what's driving us, okay? So, yeah, qualitative molecular design is happening every day. It's, it's, it's modelers talking with chemists, it's making decisions, it's designing molecules, and it's working, more or less. Computational chemistry has an impact on drug discovery. The transition to something quantitative is going to be a change in the way we would work, and we want to know if that's really viable, if it's really going to work. So I'm going to skip the introduction. I'm going to straight into my first application. I call this base, and it's spiros, because it's a certain type of chemical series, spirocyclic chemical series. Both of the two base applications that I'm going to present have just recently been published, so please go and check out these papers if you'd like more details. Okay, base. Base has evolved a lot. It's not a very old target, actually, base. It's um, only around 12 years old, 13 years old as a target. And the chemistry has evolved rapidly from peptidic inhibitors and amino alcohol type inhibitors. And then in the last sort of 8 to 10 years, everyone's working on these amidine type structures. We were working on this chemistry. We made molecules like this. They were moderately potent. We made these. They're completely inactive. But this scaffold is very novel, so we wanted to explore it more with the type of substitutions that um, other people had used in this position, but with different scaffolds. So this was our aim, to study this type of scaffold in the base binding site. Base interacts this, this uh, protonated, basically charged, positively charged uh, amidine group, interacts with the two catalytic uh, aspartates, and then you have the usual sort of peptidic side chain pockets, P1, P3, and so on, and P2 primed on the other side. I'll be mentioning those quite a bit. So before we jumped into the prospective work, we did a big retrospective study. So we we already did. We took from the literature some uh, close analogues from this scaffold. 32 compounds were in this table in, in, a, in a JMED chem paper shown here. And we ran the FEP on them. We did different times. We calculated the free energy uh, after normalization. We looked at the MUEs, etc. We could do this. There was a crystal structure of this uh, scaffold shown, so these compounds were just manual superposition to start the calculations, create a mapper like David showed earlier, all the perturbations, and here are some of the quick results. This is a single calculation, this is no repeats, but Peter will see lots <coughs> of repeats coming up later, so I might keep you happy. But this is a good result now, this is uh, 32 compounds and we've got a reasonably good correlation, okay, we've got a, we've got a easy point at the top which is helping the correlation. But the MUE here is really good. It's only 0.6 kcal, and I can tell you that it doesn't change much between 5 and 20 nanoseconds, suggesting that sampling didn't make a great deal of difference in this case. And we'll see later that many cases where it will do. That's because these compounds are very close analogues. Other methods that we would typically use, not necessarily that you would necessarily do in academia or whatever, but methods that we would have at our disposal for this type of thing, well, docking, no, it won't get you anywhere near. MMGBSA, single MMGBSA also won't. So moving to our prospective application, what we had was this scaffold, the scaffold we were interested in, we made this intermediate. We proposed, with the chemist, uh, actually proposed uh, around 18 different um, an analogues to start with, and we ran all of these in FEP in the same way. These starting geometries weren't quite as well conserved, and that's because there's no crystal structure of this series that we're looking at, so we docked these compounds, these are docking starting points create the mapper, run the perturbations. We get predicted energies, and these molecules are ranked, actually, by the way they came out of the prediction. And so we picked molecules across the selection. This was a bit of chemistry and, and computational chemistry working together specifically to test in a prospective way if FEP could work or not. So this was a real designed experiment like we would do in a project. So we selected compounds across the range. And this is the sort of results we get. MUEs for five single 5 nanosecond run around 0 0.9, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, with 20 nanosecond. That's 20 nanoseconds per 
lambda window with 12 lambda windows. And we did one set of repeats here with five nanoseconds and there was very little change in the repeats with a five nanosecond. So this is standard deviation on the computational result. But there are some outliers, so we know that sampling is having an impact. So the standard deviation doesn't change much for repeats, and maybe this is what we were, was, was being asked earlier. If a short simulation, you do a repeat, maybe it doesn't make a great deal of difference. But when you've got a big outlier like this, it does benefit from increased sampling. So if you consider the 20 nanosecond result, it's getting much closer to the diagonal, and it's moving in progressively with longer simulation time. We can look at the details of what's going on in a short lambda window simulations and perturbations. We've got a lot of issues with some of the cycles here, and the hysteresis is pretty crappy. We can go to 5 nanoseconds, it starts to improve. We can go all the way up to 20 nanoseconds, and the hysteresis is suggesting that our results are more stable. So this is not, a quali this is not telling you your results are necessarily going to correlate better with experiment, but it's saying there's better internal agreement in your results at least. And that's good for us to know when we're going to be working with perspective design. Another thing we look at, convergence of the simulations with respect to time. So for an easy perturbation here, which is really only the introduction of a nitrogen, sp2 nitrogen into this ring, correlation is very good. Eh? This looks like a bit of fluctuation, but the, the degree of fluctuation here is tiny. Look at the scale of this. Compare that with something where there's quite a big structural change in a perturbation, and this is drifting. And this is a bit of a problem. If you run this five nanoseconds, it's, it's moving around, but it's, uh, it's not moving too much. But if you run it longer, you start to see change. And that's because this, you have to go into the details in every case, and that's because this side chain goes into a pocket and it goes into what's called the 10S loop, and the 10S loop is very flexible at the bottom of the P3. I could show more examples of this where you'll see the same easy perturbations, well converged. It looks like there's some variation there, but look at the scale, it's not really moving. Look at this one though, it's never really plateauing even at 20 nanosecond lambda windows to make a sort of perturbation like that, etc. So if we summarise those results, we did a retrospective study first, a big retrospective study on 32 molecules, and things were very well behaved, I would say, in terms of um, mean unsigned error, that's the difference between the predicted and the experimental uh, binding affinity. Some improvement going from 1 to 5 nanosecond, and after that, no benefit of additional sampling. Consider though the prospective example, where I think we have a more difficult starting point, we're using docking geometries, the crystal structure is not, the, the, the protein is not in a crystallographic conformation that res, with respect to the ligand. It's one that we've just taken from another chemical series. And we do see some improvement with sampling. And of course, when we get to 20 <coughs> nanoseconds, actually we've got a very, good, uh, a very good unsigned error compared to experiment that's in the same range as the retrospective set. And I'll also show another example where we see similar things. Our second example. Here we have a scaffold, another base scaffold. So this is what I like to do is the same target now, different chemical series, and let's really see if we see consistent results. Here what we're going to do is change the size of this scaffold. We're going to also change this P2 substituent, which is what's coming off this chiral carbon here and goes backwards. And we're also going to change again the P3 pocket. We're going to make three different scaffolds. We're going to try and do perturbations on those. We're going to do perturbations here and perturbations in P3. So this is quite an extensive study. If that is a massive study, we did a lot of calculations here. And we're going to do perturbations in all the different pockets and see how it behaves. So we synthesize these molecules with three different scaffolds with seven different R groups, 21 compounds. We use this set to define the scaffold perturbations. So we can use the same R group and just change the scaffold. And that's what we're doing, and we're going to do it seven times. And then in this case, we're going to do the P3 pocket. Well, we're <coughs> going to keep the same scaffold, but we're going to do the perturbation between the seven different R groups. And we're going to do that three times for each scaffold. And then we're going to look into the P2 prime pocket. We're only using one scaffold here. It's the five-membered ring. And we're looking at just different substituents that go into the P2 prime pocket. And there's really, really small change here. Look at this. There's methyl, methoxy, ethoxy, fluorochloro. So this is really small. And we create the mapper. We run the calculations. We're running standard FEP. Um, we're running three repeats in every case. We're running time lambda windows between 2 and 40 nanoseconds. What's the results like? This, as you can predict, was pretty difficult. Perturbing this with standard FEP approach meant obliteration of this whole ring and reconstruction of the whole ring, and it's right on top of these catalytic aspars. It's actually a crucial interaction. In the early days, we were looking at there's all sorts of things were going wrong. Right. We started this three years ago, and the chirality was changing in perturbations and stuff. Eventually, 
a lot of bugs were worked out, and, and the, the, the calculation is correct, but it still can't get the right answers. Difficult transformation. Then we use this new method that David mentioned earlier this morning, where you can actually introduce, it's called core hopping, where you're basically going to introduce a, a new bond creation term, so you don't have to do the whole obliteration of the ring, and we actually get pretty good results. <coughs> What's interesting here is we do five nanoseconds, a single simulation, the results are awful. Gets a little bit better with, uh, with doing repeats, but, <coughs> but just doing more sampling didn't really help. So five nanoseconds to 40 doesn't make any difference. So, I think we, we came to the conclusion it's not really an issue of sampling, it's just things are just fundamentally difficult about this and going wrong and you just get the wrong confirmation or something. Whereas this, when you make the, the actual transformation, the perturbation itself more simple, you get better answers. Other methods don't get these ranking right of these scaffolds at all. We looked at the P3 pocket. Here we've got error bars because everything's done in triplicate. And we also look at the MUE as well. We did the 5 and the 40 nanosecond. I'm just showing those. We did many others in the paper. Here's an example. 5 nanosecond single, 5 nanosecond triplicate. It doesn't make a big difference. It's the same as what we saw in the first case. So that's quite good in a way. Um, the standard deviation uh, comes down a little bit when we go from 5 to 40 nanoseconds. So it suggests that the results are getting more reliable. So there's less change and variation. That's also a nice thing to see. And the, basically the MUE here is very similar to what it was for the P3 pocket perturbations in the first example, which was a completely different chemical series. That's really nice. I think this is getting around as good as we can expect, and it's good to see that two different chemical series with substitutions in the same pocket give similar results. P2 prime pocket, really the easiest case, I think, for FPP in terms of these substitutions are tiny, and the results are really good. The results are really good in every case. There's no variation hardly with repeats or with increased sampling. It just gets the right answer. Glide also gives a good answer for this, and it's worth noting as well. This is a relatively easy case, and docking can also do good. We can go into details on what was happening in outliers. One of the things we like to do is looking at these standard deviations. So I've covered over here what the actual predicted versus uh, were errors were. This is the actual error versus experiment, but this is the standard deviation for the repeat. So why does the standard deviation for the repeat get in bigger and then smaller? What's going on? Well, the best thing we could think of from the analysis we did, of course, you can't be sure this is the case, but what we see in the intermediate um, time length simulations is this flat, which sits on top of the ligand. It's crucial. It's, called, it's just called the active site flat. Opens and closes. It's very flexible. In a 10 nanosecond time scale, it's either open or closed. You take the average of these energies, you get the right result. That's why the MUE is pretty good. But standard deviation is high, I think, because if it's open or closed, you get a different energy. You run it for longer, open and closes, and samples good in, in both cases. <coughs> so that's why very short time lengths, this doesn't really move. Very long time lengths, it samples sufficiently. Intermediates, it opens or it closes, and so you get differences in repeats, <coughs> although you still get a good answer at the end. What happens when we do long simulation, and we look, why do we still get some standard deviation on a really long simulation? when most of them are pretty good. The standard deviations are we're running repeats at 40 nanoseconds per lambda window, three repeats, and we're getting very stable results. This one, no, why not? The best we can see from analysis of the trajectories is that when you run with this side chain, you don't see any movement of this other loop, which is at the bottom of the P3 pocket. It gets locked. Whereas in a typical one where results are standard deviation is good with repeats, you get plenty of sampling, opening and closing. That's the ones in the gray, the normal gray. So. <coughs> Overall then, just a summary of this base work, we did the P3 pocket perturbations, well predicted, uh, as in the first study. Scaffold perturbations were a big challenge, but they did improve with the scaffold hopping FET. P2 pocket was easy and was, was well predicted with all of our protocols that we use for FEP. And outliers can arise from protein flexibility and often in distal parts of the protein, and you have to be aware of that. A couple more examples on, 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 on a PD2 inhibition project. This is work in progress from the point of view of writing up, but this is what we really want to do with FEP. We want to take a hit to lead project where we've got a scaffold and we want to do chemistry on this preparatine nitrogen and we want to explore it with FEP and we want to predict molecules for synthesis and we want to see if we get good results. So we've got a crystal structure of this chemical series. We know how it binds. We did a small retrospective study to begin with. Okay, reasonable agreement at that level. So we went ahead and over the course of five or six months, did separate rounds of FEP with the chemists, designing the molecules, running the calculations, 50, 40 molecules every month, 
and then synthesizing examples from, from, from the calculations. Compounds started out quite diverse in the beginning. In the first set, we had amides and what I call ar heteroaromatics. That's the type of substitution you can get on this nitrogen. But as we found more actives and we focused in every month, the, the sets became smaller, and that's why the, the MUE gets better as well, because we're getting more narrow in our chemical diversity and closer to active space. This is a massive study and in the end, a really massive prospective study. And these are the results we saw for the different chemical series. The really interesting thing here is that we found something unexpected. We found this molecule here, which is from a chemical series where the vast majority were in an intermediate activity range. And this one jumped out as being much more potent and was predicted to be so. And that's why we made it. We wouldn't have considered this otherwise. And it turned out to be a very interesting molecule with a different type of substitution to the rest of these guys, which were from the same chemical class. They're all arrowheads. Docking doesn't work at all for this. So you can run, in this case, what we've shown is how we can really use it in a prospective way. Um, this was quite easy as well, and I'd say because of this is quite solvent exposed, the predictions were good, and we followed up uh, quickly with synthesis. So in this case, I think this is a nice example of how we want to use it and we actually found a compound quite different. My final example, though, is one where we're really struggling and we don't know the answer why. And it's a wonderful data set. Again, it's PD2 inhibitors. It's an internal chemical series. We have a crystal structure of this HIT, early HIT, which is a very potent PD2 compound, but it's not particularly selective. And by our qualitative molecular design approach, we basically improve the selectivity of this by suggesting that we did some docking of other reference compounds that had probably went up into a top pocket here, into the top region here. So we said, this can probably open, so let's substitute. And we did that, and we found molecules like this where potency on PD2 was maintained, but they're really selective versus other PDUs. And that's because it induces this movement of this leucine, and this chain comes into a pocket. In the process, it also displaces waters, and it binds potently and selectively. So what we wanted to do then is see, well, we did that a few years ago. Can we actually predict that retrospectively? Because this is a really good case. It's not a huge protein movement. It's a small side chain. It should work, right? That's what FEP is designed for. Like I said, it's a great data set. We've got a smooth transition of ligands with substituents, all from the same scaffold with this substituent, always constant. And all we're doing is changing really this R group. Occasionally, this is a pyridyl or a phenyl. We have a really good data set. It's two, just over two log units of activity range. That could be a bit better. Um, but also we have the X-ray structure of the open, uh, X-ray structures of the open and the closed. So this we call the open, where this leucine has moved open. <coughs> Create a mapper. We've we've run these calculations and they're rubbish. And we don't really know why. And we're doing a load of analysis, and I'm not going to go into it all. But the overall MUE is is way over a KCal and getting into a really bad range. And I say. A lot of cal we've done a lot of calculation. Whenever I see MUEs like this, it's just, it's just chuck away stuff, as far as I'm concerned. Because with this kind of MUE, if we're working in a, an affinity, a micromol, sub micromolar affinity, it's useless to predict <coughs> activities. If we're only working in a two or three log unit range of activity. So if we split this, though, into what we call small compounds and large compounds, small ones are the ones that don't go into that top pocket, large ones are the ones that do. Now, the large ones aren't too bad, but the small ones are way off. And why the error is so high? If we look at the actual perturbations themselves, the delta delta Gs, it shows something quite interesting. A small molecule perturbing to another small molecule, roughly in the bottom left here. So experiment versus predicted. It's, there's no correlation in this box, but at least you're in the bottom left quadrant. A large molecule to a large molecule, also not too bad. A few up here. But, but when we actually do that transition of a small to a large molecule, and we need to go into that pocket, it, it breaks down completely, and the errors up here are huge more than three, three and a half kcals in this individual delta delta Gs. What's going on? There is a little bit of, little bit, this is 40 nanoseconds, for example. This is a, a, a small to small, which generally work OK, not too bad. It's relatively stable, a bit of movement. But this is drifting, and something's happening here. We've done an analysis. We've got some ideas on this one. We're going to go into it yet. But we've done a lot of different protocols on this. We've looked at. Alternative protein structures, we've got multiple crystal structures where loops move and loops, loops change, so we're running different crystal structures. We've got um, different conformations, slightly different conformations of the rotation of the ligand. We're doing sampling, of course, we're doing repeats, we're doing <coughs> extended times to see if that makes a difference. 
the standard protocol in, in Schrodinger does not include the protein in the rest region, so we've included that to see if that also assists in, in, in opening up that leucine and seeing if it doesn't make any difference. We've used some Grand Canonical Monte Carlo to try and place the waters that need to be in that pocket at the beginning, and they do get placed, but it still doesn't affect the energetics. And we tried changing the mapper, changing the perturbations, we're actually running double in the number of perturbations, for instance, and seeing if that makes a difference, but nothing. The only thing that we've come close to is this alternative protein confirmation, and we're digging more into this. It may be that we need to look at a completely alternative oligomeric state of the enzyme it's not revealed from the crystal structures we're working on. That's just an idea, but at the moment we are running out of ideas, and this is as good as we can get in this case, which is, a, I think, a perfect sort of molecular design case. Induce a small movement and go into a pocket, displace water, and, uh, and, and maintain activity. So summary, um, of course FEPAC performs industry standard, and I mean industry standard, I don't mean other sophisticated methods, I mean just docking or some very simple MMGBSA, which is the sort of stuff we would routinely do. Of course it outperforms that, and of course it's good that the Schrodinger people have implemented it a way that, that FEP can be industry standardly implemented by us now, and yeah, that, that helps of course. FET performance is good when such small structural changes, uh, little ligand or protein solvent variation, or this pocket is solvent exposed, but if you go into buried pockets, it's a struggle. Surprisingly, FEP struggles even with small protein movement cases, and I've shown one example, but we've got some others. We're highly interested in repeats, reproducibility and failures, for obvious reasons. We're doing this all the time, trying to look at that. All the time looking at failures. This is important. Uh, we've seen it all the, not all the time, we've seen it more and more. If you get some small, some slow structural variation, even in the distal part of your protein, because for some reason it's not quite well behaved in the time scales that you're running your, per your, your simulations, it's going to mess up all your energies when you compare perturbations with similar perturbations. It won't be the same. If you do repeats, it won't be the same. So this behavior of loops that can even distal is quite important. And buried waters are still, I think we've got a great solution because GCMC is uh, proposed as a way forward with this, but we're not seeing it. Finally, acknowledgements. We've had uh, a couple of people doing a lot of work here. Henrik and Laura, who worked a lot on this, these calculations. People at Schrodinger who help us with all our technical lifters. And the chemistry collaborations we've had where we specifically tried to test FET. And if you're interested, please check out the, the recent papers. And that's it.